and welcome to this ninth episode, nearly into double figures, of A Grand Tour with my great-great-granddad. I'm Ed Hill, and as I hope those who've listened before know, this podcast really revolves around the series of journals written by my great-great-grandfather, William Mowbray Scott, way back in the 1840s. And what I do is, to summarise in a microcosm, I read a bit from the journals and then I stop and then I explain a little bit about what my great great granddad has just written about and then I start again reading the journals and then I stop again and then I explain a bit more and that's it really that's essentially the whole raison d'etre of the podcast it's very simple usual things there is a twitter page related to this podcast that's called Scots of Historic, and that's at 3G The Grand Tour. That's the number three, The Grand Tour. So if you want to get in touch with me about anything, you can do. I'm also just about in the process of setting up a Facebook page as well, dedicated to the podcast. I'll do tell you what that is. And that's it. So that's a good way of interacting with me, if you so wish. And whatever platform you're listening on, do subscribe. It's on YouTube, it's on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, TuneIn. In whatever way you access your podcasting pleasure, just Google it. Just Google Grand Tour with my great-great-granddad. should come up there in the results. It's on Google Podcasts as well. So it's universally available to those who wish to listen. Anyway, I'm going to start reading from the journals soon just to explain where we are in this episode and what we cover. At last... We do finally, at the end of this podcast, William starts his journey from Paris. So up until now, nearly all the, apart from the first podcast, well, first and I would say second podcast, all the other podcasts have been devoted to his time in Paris. And finally in this one, he begins going to the Palace of Versailles and then he embarks on his journey down to Italy where he's going to end up as an engineer on one of the very, very earliest railways in Italy as an engineer and train driver. So this one, it will begin with his trip to Versailles and then his leaving of Paris and making his way down through France, across the Alps and into northern Italy. Well, he gets to the Palace of Fontainebleau at the end of this one, so you can discover a bit about that at the end of the podcast. I always say this, it's been quite difficult to edit and choose what things to talk about and which things not to talk about. Um, because sometimes you just think, oh, I really have to explain that. Unless you're an extremely knowledgeable historian, which of course many people are, but I'm not one of them, you won't know some of the things he's referencing. So uh, there's a few things in here that I've kind of had to explain, and that subsequently meant yet again, as I seem to say now at the end of every one of these podcasts, it ended up being a bit longer than I wanted it to. But <laughs> them's is the breaks, as are once illustrious leader, Mr. Boris Johnson, said recently. <sighs> Sometimes I wish I was living back in the 19th century, to be honest. Right, time to kick off the journals again. Hope you enjoy them. This week kicks off at Versailles. And as I say, do sign up. It'd be great to get some interaction with people as well. So that's the reason for creating the Facebook page. And I hope to create a Facebook group as well. I have to say, I'm a bit of a social media numpty, really. Um, I'm not really au fait with it all. So a lot of promoting this podcast seems to involve social media. And I'm sort of getting to terms with it, but it's taking me a little while. You know, I'm also looking into things like Instagram, which I know nothing about, and God forbid, even TikTok. But the reason I'm doing all these things is in the interest of the endeavour of bringing... I think, my great-great-granddad's very special account of his time in the 19th century and his travels around Europe and the world, which, as I've mentioned before, have never been made public before in any way. So this is the first time that anyone in the world, other than in my family, is getting to hear about them. That's my main motivation for doing these podcasts, and I hope that you're enjoying it as well along the way. I have to say, it's got quite history-heavy, and I'm I'm aware of that. It's sort of evolved into that because just sometimes there has to be a lot of explaining to do to understand what William's talking about. As I'm going through the journals, I'm kind of realising just quite how much there is where he'll say something and it, it just does need 
some explanation and also i like to try and choose bits that are the more interesting as well so you know a bit quirky anyway here's the journal i hope you enjoy it April 4th. As this was to be my last day spent in Paris, it was necessary that our passports should receive the necessary signatures. The day was therefore concerned with going to the British ambassadors, to the French prefect of police in the Ile de Cité, and to the French ministre le Autranger, after which we went and took our places in the diligence for Lyon. When having dined, I spent the evening at the Café des Angles in the Palais Royal, where the concerts by the blind men are performed. And now, in summing up my visit to Paris, it may be as well to notice what Napoleon has done for this great city, for it only received very slow and partial embellishments under the old Bourbons, until that great man, zealous to make the French nation the ruling power of Europe, and Paris the capital of the world, collected together the finest portions of both ancient and modern, and partly his trophies of his own victories, and partly from a desire to render the capital of France as distinguished for the magnificence of its art and architecture as it was for its science and learning. He freed the bridges and banks of the Seine from the embarrassment and deformity of the old houses by which they were still crowded, built magnificent quays and wharves, and erected several bridges which are remarkable for their beauty. He also erected public fountains which were abundantly supplied with water. The people not merely of Paris but of the whole kingdom are indebted to him for those spacious markets so admirably arranged for the sale of every kind of produce, for public stores which surprise by their vastness and astonish by their architectural grandeur. He erected several abattoirs or slaughterhouses beyond the city walls, and thus relieved the inhabitants from the inconvenient and dangerous presence of herds of cattle and the revolting spectacle of blood. In fact, he prohibited the driving of cattle through the streets of Paris, which is still in force, not like those wiseacres eclept by the name of the Corporation of London, who still persist in the dangerous and disgusting practice of still holding a cattle market in the very centre of the most populous city in the world. He cleared the Place de Carousel between the Louvre and the Tuileries of its obstructions, and adorned it with a triumphal arch, and completed the Louvre, filled its galleries with sculptures and paintings, and built a second gallery from the adjacent angle so as to complete the square of the vast area of the carousel and the junction of the Louvre with the Tuileries. Many of the public works which were commenced by him, but left unfinished, have since been carried on, and many have been since the restoration of the old Bourbons and by the present government of France. Right, so I'm, I'm going to stop here because you can't really get a much clearer example of William's admiration of Napoleon than uh, this last extract. I mean, it is amazing to think what Napoleon did. He died at the age of 51, which is uh, the same age as me. And um, unfortunately, uh, I can't say that uh, I've achieved the domination of Europe and the world as uh, he had done in his 51 years. In fact, he actually really did it in 45 years because uh, he spent the last five to sort of six years on uh, St. Helena as well. So really, he'd achieved all these things by the age of 45. Oh, it's just showing off, really, isn't it? But it's easy to kind of just think of him as a dictator and put him on the same mould as someone like Hitler or Stalin. But there's something different about Napoleon other than his absolute huge ambition and desire for France essentially to rule the whole of Europe which he pretty well did at the height of his empire there was just also this incredible interest in every aspect of life from the sewers to the wine markets to the slaughterhouses but you can't help thinking if he'd spent a bit less time worrying about <laughs> the slaughterhouses and wine markets and, and fountains around Paris and more time on his military campaigns, he might have actually been a, a bit more successful. I've got to say that one of my things coming away from reading William's journals is certainly my opinion of Napoleon has changed from being a rather one-dimensional dictator just out for his own aggrandizement and that of France. He was an incredible person. <laughs>
And uh, I suppose it's one of those things, you know, people talk about history. Sometimes they talk about it being affected by movements and things like communism and socialism and fascism. But sometimes it's just amazing the impact that one individual can have on the world. Well, I suppose you could sadly say that's partly why we're in the situation we are with the Ukraine at the moment, with one individual who you suspect if they weren't there in power wouldn't be causing all the problems we have at the moment. Napoleon, the, the more you learn about him, the more you sort of can't help admiring him, even if it's begrudgingly. As a uh, British person, we were always at war with France, and so they were kind of our nearest and dearest enemies. But um, there's certainly no one like him in, in our own history at all. To achieve what he did in his relatively short life is quite amazing. <laughs> Now, I did want to touch on this thing because uh, I do, I like this word that William, and he uses it quite a lot in the journals, wiseacre. And it basically just means know it alls. So when he talks about the wiseacres of London Corporation, it's, it's just the know it alls. That's what he means by that. I just thought this thing about the slaughterhouses and the, the horrible spectacle of blood that William talks about it. Quite right, Napoleon was ahead of his time. He set up five cattle markets outside of the perimeter of Paris where the trading and slaughter of animals would happen. And this thing that William's talking about here is in the Smithfield's market, which of course still exists today and is still a meat trading market. But at the time, by this time, in the mid-19th century, of course, what was happening was the populations of the cities were growing much, much more rapidly than they had ever before. And so the management and slaughtering of animals just became so much more of a problem. And apparently by the mid-19th century in Smithfield Market, this is per year, 220,000 head of cattle were taken into the centre of the market and slaughtered, and 1.5 million sheep. So this, as you can imagine, this sort of bloody sight was going on in the centre of the city, right in the heart of the city, uh, right up until about the 1850s. And, and then there became this sort of movement to try and get things sorted better, both from a public health aspect, that having all this blood and slaughter and offal and all this, you can imagine. I mean, it's not a nice subject to talk about, really. Is it? I, I may, I, you may be asking, Ed, why are you bringing this up? But I do think it's sort of fascinating because by this time there was the public health issue, the spread of disease and everything, and there was this moral feeling about it too, that this slaughter going on in the middle of the street in which everyone could sort of see was somehow sort of degrading. There's a quote here. When they're talking about how watching this slaughter going on, they said... It educated the men in the practice of violence and cruelty so that they seemed to have no restraint on the use of it. So there's this kind of moral question, if you like, as well, of this, for want of a better word, blood and guts thing going on in the centre of the city. Now, it's sort of interesting, really, because you could argue it's the origins of a kind of human condition or human desire to hide away what it actually means to kill and eat animals if, if we're going to kill and eat animals what that actually means and what's involved in that and it could be argued that we in this modern day world have been far too removed from what it means to uh, if we're going to eat animals what the consequences of that are and what it actually means to slaughter them you know we go into supermarkets and our food is wrapped in nice little cellophane packages and uh, we don't really think of the cost of it so I would say there's kind of is, doesn't it? It sort of shows at heart as early as 18, sort of 40, 50, whatever, early beginnings of the 19th century, there's this feeling that this sort of thing should be out of sight and out of mind. Of course, I'm not advocating that we go back to slaughtering animals in the streets, but you do have to question this sort of thing of what it does mean to kill an animal and then eat it. I, I'm getting it's a bit heavy here, isn't it? This is getting very heavy. I don't really mean to get like this. So this was the whole thing. It was getting far too gruesome a thing to observe in the city. So they later rebuilt Smithfield Market, but they also built what was called the Metropolitan Cattle Market, which was in Islington. 
and that opened in 1855 and the idea of that was the cattle would be taken there and the slaughter and killing of the animals would take place there and this was opened up by prince albert as a sign of progress of how finally britain and the london corporation were addressing this problem of animals being marched every week and killed every week in the center of the city and so yeah the metropolitan cattle market was set up in Islington it was near a railway line so the animals could be transported more easily to and from the countryside close to London and um, there were other markets similar to other markets uh, built up around the city but Smithfield Market of course does still exist today but of course the actual slaughtering of the animals doesn't take place there and most of the meat that's sold and traded in the market is uh, transported by road these days. It could be argued it's still quite unusual that there is a, such a big meat market in the centre of the city because certainly Napoleon thought it was a bad idea and I think it's by about 1810 he'd instigated this system of having the uh, the cattle market sort of outside of the perimeter of the city of Paris and shall we say a much more civilised way of processing animal meat nice <laughs> so sorry this has been a rather gruesome topic to talk about but it's social history isn't it and this is the thing that sometimes william mentions these things and it does make your well it raises your interest in what that actually meant at the time and why he is expressing his views he was certainly not alone i think dickens is um mentioned as uh, criticizing it and in fact comparing what they did in paris to what the situation was in london anyway let's let's get back to the journals and uh, the more pleasant subject of the palace of versailles now this bit i'm going to read pretty well just as it is verbatim i'm not going to spend too much time stopping here through the bits about versailles but there will be a little bit at the end i just have to explain a little bit of stuff about it but this is quite a long excerpt that william writes about his visit to versailles and actually his general summary of its history is fairly accurate if you wanted to look it up and of course you can look up the palace of versailles and find so much in there you know it would take me five podcasts alone just to talk about it so i'm gonna not go into too much detail about versailles when i read this next extract in william's journal about his visit to the palace there <laughs> Sunday, April 5th, the Palace of Versailles. Rose and breakfasted very early this morning and started off to the Paris and Versailles railroad station where I found a train just ready to start. and at ten o'clock I was at the wonderful and magnificent palace on which the kings of France have expended so many millions of money. Until the middle of the seventeenth century, Versailles was an inconsiderable village, with a hunting castle. Louis the Fourteenth determined to erect on this solitary spot a royal residence, worthy of the age and his grandeur. Seven years, namely, from 1673 to 1680, were employed in completing the palace, parks and gardens, around which a city with regular streets and handsome buildings and a population of a hundred thousand souls soon grew up the palace erected after the plans and under the inspection of jules rodin mansart is more than eight hundred feet in length consisting of a first story and the attic decorated with ionic pilasters with fifteen projecting buildings supported by isolated columns of the same order it contains eight magnificent saloons adorned with statues, paintings, and architectural embellishments, and the great gallery, 280 feet long, 30 broad, and 37 high, and lighted by 17 great windows. The gallery is indebted to Charles Lebrun for its architecture and paintings, and is not surpassed by any in Europe for magnificence or taste in the arrangement. There are also four other galleries for sculpture that have been recently erected. The entrance is by superb iron gates into an enormous courtyard, 
the palace stretching round three sides of it. In the centre stands an immense equestrian statue of Louis Fourteenth. Round the court, at equal distances, and placed also on pedestals, are colossal statues of some of the most distinguished men in France under the old regime, and all the marshals of the Empire of Napoleon. Having satisfied my curiosity, I entered the chapel, and of all the gorgeous places of worship that I have ever seen, or read of, fell far, far below it, for beauty and design, delicacy of execution, and richness and variety of ornament. I then passed through saloon after saloon, all of the same costly description, filled with historical paintings of all the principal events in the history of France, the marriages of its kings, and of Napoleon, the great battles of the old regime, all the splendid victories of the Republic, the Consulate, and Empire of Napoleon, all the events of the Three Days Revolution of July 1830, and several of the battles of Algeria under the regime of Louis-Philippe. Then I passed through the sculpture galleries, and there stood before the kings and queens of France for a thousand years gone by, nor were there others wanting to complete this historic chain, for there stood the great Duke of Sully, Joan of Arc, the wily and intriguing Richelieu, and many others of distinguished fame. In one gallery, devoted entirely to females, I found most of the celebrated women that have figured so conspicuously in France, and ruled the king and the kingdom also. Agnès Sorel, Diana of Poitiers, Duchess de la Valois, Madame de Maintenon, and a host of others. These were mistresses of the kings of France, or their consorts. I then entered the gardens, and fortunately, as my visit was on the first Sunday of the month, all the grand fountains, chest de Ur, etc., were in full play. The gardens certainly display all that ingenuity could devise or wealth purchase. Curious plants, statues, greenhouses, conservatories, waterfalls, fountains, paintings, in most incredible variety and numbers. All I can say of Versailles is this that description cannot convey any idea of its magnificence. It must be seen to be understood and credited. It is all that a nation's wealth could obtain when placed in the hands of prodigal kings and ministers who stopped at nothing to please the ambition or gratify the luxury or voluptuousness of their masters. The words which Bulwer put in the mouth of the monk when addressing Louis the Fourteenth, commonly called Louis le Grand, occurred to me many times during that day and they are these. A million soldiers bled to buy thy greatness, a million peasants starved to build Versailles. And filled with those reflections, I hastened to the railway station, and entering a carriage was soon on my road to Paris, on reaching which I proceeded directly to my hotel, and having dined, a few of my fellow countrymen and myself discussed our cognac and cigars, after which I returned early to bed to prepare myself for encountering the fatigue of the remainder of my journey, and thus brought to close my visit to the metropolis of France. Versailles is ten leagues from Paris, present population 60,000. Right, so that's William's visit to Versailles there. Just at the end there, he refers to this quote about a million peasants starved to build Versailles. I can't find any reference to this actual quote, but I have, I think, uncovered who it's from, who he refers to there. He says, couldn't help but think of the words of Bulwer. Now, this may be a bit in the text where I've read William's handwriting wrong, or it might be that he got the name slightly wrong, but I think he's referring to someone called Isaac Joseph Bervier, who was a theologian and historian who wrote several books about the history of religion and history of France. And certainly there does seem to be this link to this person called Louis Le Grand, this monk, as he describes, put into the mouth of the monk when addressing Louis the Fourteenth. Louis Le Grand was also a sort of historian who edited some of Bourrier's works as well. So there does seem to be some connection there. And so this must be the person who wrote this quote. I mean, they're pretty heavy-going Jesuit theological tomes that both these people were involved in writing. And unless you're a real historian of theology and Jesuit and Roman Catholic thought, you may not have heard of them. But somehow they must have been famous enough at the time for William to have known about them. 
it doesn't seem like the sort of would have been reading heavy tones on theology, though. What the quote does represent is the fact that Versailles, its first expansion, started under the rule of Louis the Fourteenth, and it was not only just a case of wanting to build a grand palace out in the sticks, but also a political move to move the centre of the court away from Paris to Versailles, and in fact eventually did sort of make it the de facto centre of government in France. So it was a way of weakening the power of rival aristocrats by making Versailles the court where everybody had to attend and uh, spend their time and be in the orbit of the king. But of course this huge grandeur and splendour that um, the palace sort of represented later on as the French Revolution approached and when Louis the Sixteenth was now on the throne with Marie Antoinette, to some degree Versailles epitomised this splendour and profligacy of the French reigning monarchy and their uncaringness for the people back in Paris who were starving and couldn't afford bread because of high prices and things like that and when the storming of the Bastille happened Louis the 16th and Marie Antoinette were actually in Versailles and not long after that there was the women's march to Versailles where the put upon and lowly oppressed people of Paris led by the women left the markets of Paris and marched to Versailles with various sides and bill hooks and uh, other pointy stick type things and got to Versailles and demanded that the king and queen be returned to Paris and meet the National Assembly, which was the revolutionary government that was coming to the fore, and drag them away from Versailles. And in fact, through the sort of period of the time after the revolution, it was neglected and sort of put in mothballs, and it wasn't until the monarchy was restored again, and I think Louis the Eighteenth then started restoring it back to its former glory a bit, and then beyond that, at the time of Louis Philippe's reign as well. Or after the July Revolution of 1830, it was sort of restored and actually made into a bit of a museum. But this quote does represent how, as a symbol of the splendour and uncaringness and profligacy of the French royal family, was very much wrapped up in Versailles. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention regarding William's trip to Versailles was that not long after this, there was a terrible rail accident. And it was really, up until this point, it was kind of the worst railway accident that had happened in the world and it was just two years after William had travelled on this same line. This railway line must have been one of the first in France anyway because France was considered to be a bit slow in its take up of steam engines and steam powered railways and so this one must have been one of the first that was in France anyway. But this accident happened on the day it was on the Sunday the 8th of May in 1842 there'd been a sort of celebration at Versailles for King Louis Philippe's reign in the gardens of Versailles and people had spent the day there obviously enjoying it and then they all got on the train at about 5.30 to return to Paris and about halfway along the journey back the train, which was packed, there were 770 passengers estimated to be on the train. It had about 16 to 18 coaches. It actually had two locomotives at the front to pull it along. So it just goes to show how packed and busy this train must have been. Probably a bit overladen as well. And it was coming to a point in the railway. It had a cutting between a place called Moudon and Bellevue and going down the slight incline the train got very wobbly and started shaking no doubt probably because of the added weight of all the passengers on board and one of the wheels at the front locomotive broke and then it derailed and then the other steam train and then a bunch of carriages all piled over the top of the locomotive that had come off the rails and there was a, a big fire you can imagine all these carriages at the time would have been made of wood. So there was a big fire. And unfortunately, what made it even worse was that 
the passengers at that time, the convention was to lock people into the carriages because they were sort of scared people to fall out. But of course, when this terrible fire happened, it also made it very difficult for them to escape quickly from the blaze. So it's estimated that between 50 and 200 people were killed in this terrible conflagration, as they say. So this was really the first big major railway accident that had happened in the world. And it then led to an investigation into metal fatigue. Because the wheel of the front train had broken, people started to look at things and see if there were cracks in it and so forth. And whether that it was obviously one of the causes of it. And after that time, two things changed. One was to not lock the carriages anymore. And the second was to regularly inspect and, if need be, change the wheels on the carriages and locomotives if they showed signs of metal fatigue, which wasn't very well understood at that time. And actually this accident was the beginnings of investigation and scientific study of the causes and problems around metal fatigue. It was a terrible disaster. Um, most of the people died in the flames of this fire. One notable passenger who died, and sadly all his family died as well, was a very famous French naval officer and explorer called Jules de Mont de Ville. And I think you would call him a kind of French equivalent of Captain Cook, with a bit of Charles Darwin rolled into one, really, because uh, he was not only a great naval officer and explorer, but he was a bit of a scientist as well. And he did very similar journeys at a similar time to Captain Cook out to the Pacific and New Zealand and places like that to explore and chart areas around that part of the world. And he also led a very well-known expedition to the Antarctic as well in his ship, which was called Astrolabe. And there's pictures of it there in the ice, trapped in a similar way to Shackleton's uh, ship Endeavour. But uh, they managed to get their ship out. So there's large areas of water and sounds and things named after de Mont de Ville. Sadly, he died in this rail crash along with all his family. And they, they only identified him because a sculptor had done a taken a cast of his head and of his skull when he was sort of doing, a obviously, an artwork in honour of the great man. And this cast was used to identify his body after the uh, tragedy of the rail crash. I mean, the railways were quite dangerous at this time. It was an early technology, but despite these early disasters that were relatively frequent, people were still willing to get on board trains because they offered so much more opportunities when it came to travelling and the speed of travelling. I mean, this train, apparently, when the crash happened, was meant to be going... I mean, it wasn't going that fast. It was going about 25 miles an hour when the crash happened. But that, of course, was twice, three times as fast as you'd be able to go on any other form of transport at that time with a horse or carriage. It really was the first and worst global rail incident. So I imagine William would have been locked in his carriage like those poor unfortunate people who were killed in the crash. But fortunately for him that day, it must have been a quiet day and he wasn't involved in anything as serious as that. Monday, April 6th. Left Paris at seven in the morning by diligence for Lyon. Passed through Corbeil at about nine. A large village pleasantly situated on the rise of a hill. From whence we reached Melun, an ancient city situated on the Seine, nine leagues from Paris. It is a manufacturing place and has three annual fairs. One of them was being held at the time we passed through, and the concourse of strangers appeared to be very great. The river Seine here forms an island and is crossed by two stone bridges, one of which has an arch of 159 feet, 10 inches span, and 14 feet, 10 inches high. Louis the Fourteenth and his court resided here some time during the war with the Fronde. So the Fronde, I'll try and sum it up as succinctly as I can, was basically a series of civil wars between 1648 and 1653, and it was essentially a struggle about who had control and more power over the running of France, and it, it was a struggle really between the monarchy who were in place, and a lot of the rest of the nobility. Now, the monarchy in place was Louis the Fourteenth, 
his mother, Anne of Austria, and Cardinal Mazarin, who was the successor to Cardinal Richelieu. So they were the government in power. Louis XIV at this time was still very young, so that may explain why he was in Milan while this conflict was going on, because really it was Anne of Austria and Mazarin who were really the ones holding the reins. It basically comes down to a struggle from those in power with the rest of the nobility, represented by a group called the Parlement, Parliament, so I suppose a bit like the House of Lords, about who has power over France and what the king could do and what he couldn't do. And the Parliament wanted to restrict what the king could do, i.e. raising taxes for a war. They were at war with Spain, so they didn't want him to do that. Things like arbitrary imprisonment, obviously that was something they didn't feel was fair either. Basically, this is where the conflict came in. And so there was two parts of the front. There's the front of the Parliament, which is this initial struggle where the nobility known as the Parliament had a series of conflicts with the government powers and to some degree were successful in getting what they wanted in terms of restricting the power of the existing power, i.e. Anne of Austria, Mazarin, etc. But sort of what happened in the meantime was France actually then won the war against Spain and so Anne of Austria and Mazarin kind of went back on the agreement because they'd won the war, they didn't need the taxes that they'd been demanding anymore. And so they sort of reneged on their, their agreement with the original poll. There's then the second part of the Fronde, which it essentially mainly revolves around an aristocrat called Louis II de Bourbon, Prince de Conde. He's often referred to as the Great Conde. And he was disgruntled because he'd helped the government, i.e. Anne of Austria and all that, in the first Fronde. Just to say, by the way, Fronde translated kind of means like it's like a game that was played by kids in the street in Paris with a slingshot. So it's the idea of, you know, you throw a stone at a policeman and then run away. It's kind of that resistance against authority sort of thing. Sorry, getting back to the second Fronde, which is called the Fronde of the Princes, this great Cond, he was disgruntled because he'd helped out of Austria in the first Fronde and he'd hoped to essentially get more power himself and have more influence over the young Louis the Fourteenth, and uh, in a way take the place of Cardinal Mazarin and he just thought well I want to be the big cheese now and this didn't happen so he was very disgruntled about that and he was arrested I think by the government and then his other aristocratic chums all got behind him and they tried to have another uprising and they marched on Paris and had conflicts there but actually what happened was when he got to Paris militarily it wasn't a great success in fact he was nearly defeated by the government forces so it kind of petered out really and so that essentially was the end of the fronde and the main thing from it was that it reinforced the power of the monarchy and the existing government those in power and um, after that there weren't any major challenges and it sort of also reflects back to what i said earlier about louis the 14th and the creation of Versailles as a sort of centre of government as well. It was a way of keeping power from this rival members of the nobility, keeping power away from them and centering it around the king and his court. So in a way, the creation of Versailles as it became was a result of the Fronde. And it did sort of reinforce the power of the monarchy and the ancient regime, as it was called, which of course later on was one of the reasons for the French Revolution, because you could say the power of the monarchy sort of went unchecked by this. There wasn't a counterbalance. The, the Parlement had been, in a way, to some degree, counterbalancing the king's power. But after the Fronde, that severely weakened the rest of the nobility. So back to the journal and the Palace of Fontainebleau. The celebrated Peter Abelard established a school here in the 12th century, Population about 500 persons. We reached the forest of Fontainebleau about one o'clock, where we got out to walk up a very steep hill. This forest is an immense tract of ground, very unequal in surface. The trees are not very thick, and as far as the eye could reach, immense detached rocks were scattered about in all directions, some of them as large as houses, some of them varying from six to ten and fourteen feet square. The ground, where not covered with stones, was sandy and barren, and showing no sign of vegetation, but a few rushes and some very coarse brown grass. About two o'clock we reached the town of Fontainebleau, which is of considerable size, and contains a very fine royal palace. 
It was a favourite residence of Napoleon, and it is also rendered remarkable by being a place where he signed his abdication and took leave of his favourite officers and imperial guard previous to his departure for the island of Elba. The table on which he signed his abdication is still preserved in the palace, and a brass plate is inlaid on the top of a pillar commemorative of the event. It is as follows, or as near as my imperfect knowledge of the language would allow me to translate it. On the 5th of April, 1814, Napoleon Bonaparte signed his abdication on this table in the Cabinet du Roy of the Palace of Fontainebleau. This palace was originally a mere hunting lodge before it rose to be a regular royal residence. Being built at various times, the architecture of course varies considerably, but its leading character is of the sage of Francis I, who sent for the most celebrated artists from Italy to decorate its walls. Henry IV, Louis XIV and Louis XV enlarged it considerably, and Madame de Montespan and Du Barry lavished millions on its decorations. It possesses a fine sculpture gallery. Amongst the eminent men it contains are Alexander the Great, Demosthenes, Cicero, Gustavus Adolphus, the Duke of Marlborough, Washington, Duke de Sully, Colbert, Louis d'Assaye, and Henry IV. It's Louis Charles Antoine d'Assaye. Some of the apartments are beautifully painted in arabesque and contain superb furniture, fine specimens of Sèvres porcelain, and some good oil paintings. Here also are the fresco paintings of Francesco Primazzizio and Beningo Bossi, still fresh after the lapse of nearly three centuries. The gallery itself is curious as a monument of the history of the arts, and as a model of a style of building now discontinued. It is a most singular mixture of paintings and stucco ornaments, composed of flowers, fruit, children, men and animals, executed by Paul Poncier. So, Paul Poncier, Antoine Robert, he's the closest reference to that artist I could find. The chapel attached to the palace is ornamented with paintings and gilding, and paved with various coloured marble. The theatre is also remarkably elegant, and decorated with blue and gold. Fontainebleau was a royal residence as early as the 12th century. The visitor is still shown the apartments of St. Louis. Philippe le Bel was born and died in this chateau. It was here also that Christina, Queen of Sweden, caused her chamberlain, Count Mondeldeschi, to be put to death in her presence. It was a prison, also, of Pope Pius VII, who was confined here from the 20th June 1812 to the 23rd of January 1814. The grounds, which are extensive, are ornamented with several fine pieces of water, and in the centre of one of them stands a splendid pavilion built by Louis the Fourteenth. The front, which is opposite the town, is enclosed with lofty iron railings, each rail resembling a spear with gilt on top, a form which Napoleon adopted for nearly all his palaces. Fontainebleau is 14 leagues south-south-east of Paris, population 9,000. Right, so uh, I'm just going to say a few things about this last section of William's journal that I've been reading. Just quite a nice thing to mention at the beginning of that last section. He references Peter Abelard. I don't know if you remember in an earlier episode when he visits the cemetery of Pierre Le Chasse in Paris and he comes across the tomb of the famed medieval lovers Abelard and Helois. And uh, I mentioned then that that's what they were, famed lovers. Well, Peter Abelard was also a very famous medieval philosopher and religious theologian. So as William mentions, he formed a school here in Milan, which is near Fontainebleau. It's the town William gets to before he gets to Fontainebleau. So he's sometimes referenced as the Descartes of the 12th century. Um, he's a very influential philosopher of his time. So he'd established a quite famous career as a philosopher and a theologian before he met Helwar, Helwar de Wajentuil. But aside from his philosophy, he's equally famous, and himself and Helwar are equally famous for the tragic romance and marriage that they had in life, because he met Helwar in Paris. At some point, he's in staying at Notre Dame with Helwar's uncle, and they met, and basically they fell in love, and they secretly began an affair, and then they married, and this was all really against the wishes of this uncle of Helwar's. And so, um, in an attempt to keep Helwar safe, Peter Abler sent her away, I think, to a monastery somewhere. 
But in the meantime, while she was away at this monastery, this disgruntled uncle rather nastily had some henchmen kidnap Peter Abelard and then they castrated him. So uh, that's uh, pretty extreme. Of course, that had quite a few repercussions for the rest of their relationship. Uh, you could say, fortunately, before the uh, unwanted snip happened, <laughs> um, they had a child, a son, who they named Astrolabe, which is a, it's a rather unusual name because uh, an astrolabe is a is a sort of navigational instrument, you know, a bit like a sextant. So um, <laughs> I suppose the the modern equivalent would be calling your son Satnav. <laughs> You won't get a treat until you finish your dinner, Satnav. Even for the time, it seems to have been rather an odd name to choose. Uh, anyway, essentially, Abelard and Helwar, down the years, have come to represent a symbol of sort of doomed and tragic love. After this incident happened, Peter Abelard becomes a monk in the monastery of Saint-Denis, which is, we'd mentioned before, the Basilica of Saint-Denis, and Helwar becomes a nun and they then spend sort of the rest of their lives apart, although they do meet just before Ablar's death. And then later on, their remains are sort of reunited, and they are put into this tomb, which is the tomb at Pierre Le Chase that William mentions. So as I say, they come to symbolise, a bit like Romeo and Juliet in a way, but unlike them, Ablar and Hilwa actually existed, this sort of symbol of doomed and tragic love and romance. So uh, the other thing I was going to say was, as William's diligence journey continues, he then gets to Fontainebleau and its famous palace. Rather like Versailles, I'm not going to say a huge amount about Fontainebleau. It's actually very similar to Versailles in the sense that it's one, another one of these big palaces outside of Paris that uh, the French nobility and monarchy tend to spend some time in and later on Napoleon when he's in charge as well that table which William mentions uh, where Napoleon signs his abdication is still there it's a, you almost describe it as a little kind of coffee table really around which there are a few chairs because what happened was it got to the point where Napoleon's own generals particularly Marshal Ney said to him that we can't continue any more so he was essentially forced by them to sign this abdication. This is before he goes to the island of Elba. But if you look up the Palace of Fontainebleau, it's got all these architectural and artistic things of merit that William mentions, and I'm sure by all means Google it or whatever and uh, <laughs> and explore it yourself because you know there's lots of history there. Uh, one thing I did want to mention in this section that William writes about is this reference to the death of Mondeldeschke at the uh, insistence of Christina, Queen of Sweden. I just thought I'd explore this a, a little bit further because obviously it sounds, well, it sounds a bit interesting. I wonder what happened there. And it has to be said that Christina, Queen of Sweden, who I'd never heard of, although apparently there have been quite a few films and plays about her, she was a very interesting character for her time certainly a very unconventional royal and there are all sorts of things surrounding her life that are um, of interest I think we'd probably say particularly in a modern context firstly there's a whole thing around her her sense of her own sexuality there's been a lot of conjecture that she might have been a lesbian that she might have been asexual she might have been an intersex person all sorts of things Apparently when she was born, she was quite a hairy baby and they all thought she was a boy. But her father, Gustav Adolphus, doted on her and liked her very much and said she was going to be very clever because she'd fooled them all when she was born. And in fact, what happened was he, during his time as ruler of Sweden, had greatly increased its sort of power and reputation in Europe. But this was all part of the Thirty Years' War that was going on, which as the name suggests, continuing and ongoing struggle that was taking place in Europe throughout the time. And essentially, I mean, it began as a sort of religious war between Roman, Catholic and Protestant royal families. But then it also became territorial as well. So anyway, it dragged, dragged on and on. But anyway, getting back to Queen Christina. So what happened was her father, Gustav Adolphus, he, he went away to fight in the uh, Thirty Years' War and unfortunately was killed 
But before he departed, he recognised that Christina was definitely going to be the heir to the throne, which in that time, considering that she was a, a woman, was slightly unusual. And he insisted that she would be educated in the same way that a male monarch would be educated. I mean, what that means in uh, practical terms, I don't really know. Less needlework and more military history, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> um, but apparently she was very intelligent, very clever, a very studious scholar. And uh, it said that she could speak seven languages. So after Gustavus had died, she wasn't initially in charge. A regent was in charge because she was too young. But then she came to power in uh, 1644. And then she ruled for 10 years. And unusually, she abdicated after 10 years. But during her 10 years of time in power, she was eccentric. Sweden's power and influence continued to grow, but she was also quite bad at managing things as well. She nearly sort of brought the country to its knees economically. She was very generous in giving out gifts and things to people and appointing them as royal and giving them gifts and all this sort of stuff. And, of course, all the time as well, having this image of being unusually sort of transgender, I suppose you would say. She wore, from time to time, quite masculine-type clothes around the court. And one of the main reasons she decided to abdicate was that she didn't want to marry, which, again, ties in with this whole transgender-type thing, or speculation about whether she was a lesbian or whatever. She she said, I think at one time she said she'd rather go to war than marry, in a way, she was quite like Elizabeth I in England, who she sort of admired, I think. She was sort of slightly before her time. There are similarities there in that she was a very intelligent woman living the role of a monarch in a very much male-dominated world. But getting back to this thing, after she abdicated and uh, transferred the throne to her cousin, Charles X, I think it was, she basically just said, I had enough. And the other reason, aside from not wanting to marry, because as a monarch, you know, she was expected to produce an heir, but if she wasn't going to marry, well, obviously that wasn't going to happen. But the other thing was as well, she was essentially brought up as a Protestant, but during her years, she became more and more interested in the Catholic faith. And so she also wanted to convert to Catholicism as well. So that was another reason behind her abdication. Although even after her conversion to Catholicism, she, I think you'd have to say she had a questioning outlook to all religion. Apparently she was very tolerant of most people's faith. But after she abdicates, she then becomes this great European royal in name and in reputation. But she doesn't really have a kingdom anymore. So this is why she ends up going round Europe and spending time in various places, quite a lot of time in Italy and quite a lot of time in France. And so this is how she ends up in the Palace of Fontainebleau at the time of this death of Mondeldeschi. And um, it's all a bit obscure. It's a rather strange tale as to how he died. And it's full of intrigue, and no one really knows quite what he did that was so bad to warrant his death. Because it's alleged, well, it's not alleged, he was her master of horses or her equerry to use a term you might be familiar with in uh, the British royal family and so you know that's quite a noble position to have he was an Italian chap from a noble Italian family but after a while she's now residing in the palace of Fontainebleau with her court surrounding her so she's like been given this position of being a queen of her own little place in the palace of Fontainebleau but she suspected he was this model Jessica character was being treacherous and she discovered some letters that he'd written and no one really knows what he'd written in these letters some suggest that he'd suggested he was having an affair with her some that he suggested that another italian member of a court called santinelli was sort of having some affair with her or some people suggest that in these letters he revealed that actually she'd been involved in a plot to become Queen of Naples because <laughs> she, she, after a while, she won't fancy being a monarch again, you see. So, so she, I think it was uh, with the Mazarin, you know, old Cardinal Richelieu's successor, they'd sort of plotted in some way that she could become the Queen of Naples and that he'd given away these secrets in these letters. Anyway, no one really knows what was in the letters, but he'd betrayed her. And now she says that he 
confess this, and it's in this. Um, oh, I have to look it up. The galleries of the thing in the <coughs> Galerie de Serre or Deer Gallery. It's a kind of long hallway with lots of ornamented pictures all around it. Anyway, he's in there they're discussing his treachery and she claims that he said, oh, the only punishment that can be given for what I've done is death. And so essentially she says, well, he confessed it and that's what he said the punishment should be. So she then, literally there and then, said that um, he should be killed. And she, funnily enough, Santinelli, the, one of his rivals, this rival who he tried to stitch up, was present, of course, along with another of her men at arms, and she ordered that he be killed there and, and then. But he was wearing chainmail, so when they first tried to stab him, that didn't quite work, and they ended up chasing him round this hall, and finally he gets killed by being pierced with a sword through his throat. Nice. And, of course, this was quite scandalous at the time, in the sense that she was quite unapologetic about what had happened. You know, she, she said, this was my court, and he'd confessed it, and I dispatched the sentence but of course it ruffled a few feathers in italy because this guy was a, an italian nobleman but that's essentially what this whole scandal was about i mean she had form in this regard earlier on when she'd been on the throne in uh, sweden she'd had a chap killed her official historian his name was arnold johan uh Messi messimus <coughs> arnold johan messinius she had him killed when uh, he, he sort of fell out with her and accused her of being a Jezebel. Obviously, there's the association with a bit of a, a loose woman with that, but also um, at that time, the kind of association with being a duplicitous non-believer in religion as well. So anyway, she had him killed and his 17-year-old son. So it sounds like she could be pretty I mean, ruthless. So after this Mendel Deschke killing, she then goes back to Italy. She was a great supporter of the arts she had masses of collections of books and artwork basically she sort of spends the rest of her time in italy acquiring more and more artwork living this quite grand life attending the theater supporting the theater but eventually she dies at the age of 61 but she's actually buried in the vatican with the sort of honor that that ensues but she's certainly a, a, a fascinating character i have to say i hadn't really heard of her but I suppose she has this contemporary interest because of this whole issue around her sexuality and how she displayed it. They've even dug up her bones and did a medical examination and there's no evidence that she was physically sort of different, but they think she might have had some medical condition. But she was obviously a very charismatic person as well, so um, good on her is what I say. Although the summary executions, I think, is perhaps a side of the uh, personality that was... Uh, <laughs> A bit less admirable. Just very, very briefly, Palace Fontainebleau. The other thing William mentions is Pope Pius VII being in prison there. This is to do with the Napoleonic Wars. At the time, the Pope was not only the ruler of Rome and the Vatican City and that, but he was also ruler of the Papal States, which was a quite a large chunk of the middle bit of Italy. I think I've said before, Italy, it wasn't united till 1872 under Garibaldi. So there's all these states... Uh, when France is expanding and conquering various states around uh, Europe, old Napoleon, fair play to him, quite ambitious. <laughs> he said, well, I'm going to imprison the Pope as well. So at one time he imprisoned Pope Pius VI, and then later on, when Pope Pius VII comes along, at first he sort of tries to appease Napoleon, but then Napoleon invades the Papal States again, trying to take over all of Italy. And at that time, he gets um, captured and transported to Fontainebleau, where he spends a couple of years in prison in this palace. The idea of imprisoning a pope is quite an interesting one, isn't it? And then, and then the next moment, he's getting them to crown him as Emperor of Europe as well. He certainly had no lack of ambition, old bony, as we say, in the UK. So I'm going to stop here now. That's the end of episode nine. This seems a good place to stop once we've got to the end of William's description of the Palace of Fontainebleau. From this point on, William will continue his journey down through France by diligence, making his way to Lyon is the next major city that he comes to. Just referring back to all the things I've said before, 
do subscribe, do leave reviews if you can. Uh, it all helps to um, aid the ranking of the podcast. And do tell your friends or anyone else who you think might be interested. It'd be great to get more people on board. The next episode is uh, quite a bit of time spent in the diligence travelling through rural France. So uh, William's finally finished his long time in Paris, which uh, was uh, of great cultural benefit and interest for him, and uh, is now on his way down to Milan, where he will carry out his gainful employment. So thanks for listening. I hope you have enjoyed it. Do tune in again to episode 10, Double Figures. That's good, isn't it?